Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's virtual program um, with Turnstile Tours. I'm Andrew Gustafson. Uh, we're going to give people a couple more minutes to start joining the program today. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, um, we have, um, I see some new people joining us. Uh, welcome. And if you're a longtime visitor, I see some of those as well. Um, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Um, just a couple of things about how today's program is going to work. Um, couple technical things. If you see at the bottom of the screen, you can turn your closed captioning on or off. And we have Cindy behind the scenes who's helping us with that today. Um, if you're joining us from a, a mobile device or a tablet, you just need to exit out of this session uh, to turn the captioning on or off and then sign back into the session. Um, we're also gonna be communicating through the chat. Uh, so feel free to drop your questions in there. Um, just make sure you note that you can select all panelists, in which case it'll go to me uh, and our guests, um, or you can select all panelists and attendees, um, in which case everybody, um, uh, including all of the visitors, uh, will be able to see that. Um, so feel free to drop questions throughout and we're gonna pepper them um, throughout the conversation. Um, I just want to share a couple of things that we have uh, coming up um, in our calendar that we're um, continuing through the fall. Uh, I can't believe we're getting into fall already. Um, but uh, here are our upcoming programs. Um, so our next one is going to be on Monday. Uh, we're going to uh, explore wooden boat building uh, with the City Island Nautical Museum. Um, then on Thursday, uh, we're going to take another field trip. So we're actually going to go to um, the Prospect Park Zoo, not to look at the animals, um, but actually to explore the architecture um, and art of that really, really beautiful place uh, in Prospect Park. Um, on the 15th, we have our next free program, and that's kicking off a series that we're going to be doing uh, to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. So we're going to be listening to oral histories uh, from the archive of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, then on the 18th, we're going to stay at the Navy Yard, but we're going to look at food. We're going to talk to um, the folks at Grand Champs, which is a Haitian restaurant that's in the Brooklyn Navy Yard's uh, food manufacturing hub. Um, then on the 19th, uh, we're doing another free program. Uh, we're going to bring back uh, Howard Goldstein, who is the forest ecologist for the Prospect Park Alliance. Uh, and he's going to share with us uh, some information about the most um, famous trees and some of the less famous trees, um, really the forest ecosystem of the park. Um, and then on the 23rd, uh, we're going to do a little crafting. Uh, we're actually going to take a look at some paper craft models from a company called Epinal, which is actually from France. Um, and they really pioneered a lot of these models. Uh, it's a little hobby that I've kind of taken up during COVID. Um, and um, I'm gonna show off some of those and, and share some of these uh, sort of vi vintage uh, paper craft models that you can still find online. Um, and then of course, we wouldn't be able to do this without our members. So I wanna thank and welcome uh, our members that have joined us today. If you're not a member, um, you can become one and that'll give you access to not only our live programs, um, we do a collection of both free and paid programs, um, but also access to um, special member events uh, as well as um, our library now. This is our 125th program I think that we've done uh, since March 19th. Um, so we really couldn't do this without, without your support. So um, we just wanna thank everyone um, for that. Um, but without further ado, we're going to dive into today's program. Um, so I want to welcome uh, our guests, um, Lillian Yi Xuan uh, Lin uh, and Angel Lamar, who are both uh, designers. And they're going to be talking to us um, about a design project they did um, called the Race to Hunts Point, um, which I, to, to give you a little background, uh, I actually came to an event at the Brooklyn Army Terminal last, is it last October? Um, that was uh, hosted by FutureWorks, which is part of the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Uh, and Lillian, you were there with a booth yeah. kind of show, showcasing your project. So why don't you tell us a little bit kind of um, about yourself, uh, Lillian, if you want to start uh, and how you got into this project. Hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I am a product designer. Yeah, I currently work as a product designer at Hedy. I originally come from... Taiwan, and more specifically Taipei. Uh, it was a small country with a strong agriculture and known for good food. So I'm always interested in food. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, and Angel, where, where are you joining us from? Uh, so, hi, I'm Angel, I'm from Puerto Rico. Uh, I am currently in Oslo, Norway. Um, but yeah, I um, also have a background in industrial design. So that's kind of how I got into the Forward Fellowship Program uh, in the first place. Um, yeah. Really? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, I know you're going to, we'll get into this a little bit um, in, the, in the presentation, um, but you're going to tell us a little bit kind of about the background of the project um, and about the, the fabrication and the creation and the design of, of this board game. Um, but we're also going to talk about what the board game is actually about, which is, which is the Hunts Point market and New York City's food distribution system. Um, why was this something that you felt, you know, needed a a board game to kind of tell this story. What, what was the kind of the what was the kind of idea behind it? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think we have uh, several rounds of brainstorming and thinking what is the most uh, the best tool that can mediate this experience. And we found out that game is actually a great tool. You can uh, take user or like players to experience the whole process. And that game is a simplified model of the real work, how the, uh, the system in real work work, even though it's simplified and also abstract in multiple level. Um, but that is a way that, yeah, take the whole experience and journey throughout the process. Great. So I know we have a lot to get through. Um, so why don't we why don't we dive into um, the, the presentation you have, and then uh, towards the end of the show, Lillian, you actually have have the game with you, right? So you're yep. going to show us um, so some of the pieces and, and how it works. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. So we're gonna get started with this. Um, so yeah, no more introductions are needed. <laughs> Basically, um, oh, one sec. There we go. We already have presented ourselves really quickly just going to run through like this whole forward fellowship program um we are we were three uh different uh designers or engineers that got uh that were kind of uh met in this program uh last summer and we basically were part of it through future works as andrew mentioned already um, but more specifically we were working with brooklyn research and tomorrow lab which were kind of like the mentors and hosts of uh, the whole program. And so <clears throat> as part of our process, we had these prompts to work with, which were learning, education, development, and obviously it had to be related to New York City. And kind of, uh, as we were mentioning, uh, our process was pretty lengthy and we were starting from scratch to a degree. And kind of throughout the whole investigation that we were doing, um, we got this whole interest in the topic of food. It's uh, very incredible the, the way that seasonality works and how food is actually managed to, to get to everywhere in the city and such a dense and complex network uh, the way it, that it has been done. So we kind of dove into that topic after researching and brainstorming for a while. I think uh, Lillian, you had yeah. a story so about this. One of our burning or core question was, where does our food come from? We don't see farms <coughs> in New York City quite common. And that doesn't make sense for me personally, where, uh, where I come from a country who has uh, like strong agriculture and we have food based on seasonal. My dad always told me, oh, you should buy veggies based on season. Uh, but now when I come, yeah, come to New York and I go to the grocery store, you can see that blueberry are a, a common stock that appear on the shelf throughout the seasons. And that just doesn't make sense to me. And while we dive in to understand how, the, how does this um, system work to supply the New Yorkers food, and we found a lot of fascinating fact and yeah, perhaps we can talk about. So this is a, a chart that break down the food distribution system in New York City. You can see there are various of cells point uh, from like restaurant, bodega, supermarket. And also we have another side, which is the suppliers. And we have multiple uh, supply chain that serve to different endpoints. And Throughout this, our research, we found that there are um, multiple distribution centers spread out in the city, 
but the Hunt's Point is the biggest one, which uh, the majority of food come from that specific, uh, yeah, that's a huge building, like several buildings that form that market. And that is how our gang got inspired using the Hunt's Point. So one of the things that we um, noticed throughout our research is that this relation that a lot of people have with food. When thinking about it and looking at, uh, we were looking at uh, kind of how it happened. It's like basically the food system behind the grocery store is a huge black box. So you just go to the grocery store, you get it because it's set out and laid out for you there. And that's it. But in reality, um, it's really one of the small touch points that's connected to a whole broader, incredibly complex network. And kind of uh, realizing this and what are the bigger implications of it, we were kind of exploring how this topic could be kind of presented and experienced. And that's how we kind of got into this idea of a strategy board game for high school students, particularly. As we were talking in the beginning, um, this thing of the board game, it might sound a little bit strange, but through our research, we found out with game designers that one of the, uh, you know, the, these um, factors that board game have is that they are really good at emulating processes rather than necessarily sharing information. And that's what we were trying to do with this. So from just splurting out information, we were trying to see how we could get people to have a role which would be related to not only the whole distribution part, but rather like the bigger thing that's related to intermodal transportation, to um, how you manage the seasons, how do you distribute your time and money, how do you use land, right? So that's where we we're trying to get into this complexity of uh, food distribution, uh, a little bit beyond the city. And then one of our learning goals with this is to obviously experiment the, the complex uh, interplay, so to speak, of all these factors, um, not only to learn it to a degree, but also kind of uh, yeah, relate to it and articulate the concept to other people, specifically their peers. And so, um, yeah, Lillian is going to run us through now like some of the elements of the game. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, let's uh, walk you through the basic mechanism of this game. So, as you can see, this is the whole uh, game board and there are multiple chunks of it. And imagine that you are, um, yeah, imagine you are operating a food business consultancy, which you oversee uh, the process saying cover, uh, cultivation, transportation, and also the trading and how you cycle those profit back to uh, invest in, in your business. So that's the basic idea. You have to manage uh, your time and money, which are the major resource in this game. You have the option to use those ref, uh, resource to grow crops, or you can invest in technology that can emulate your, yeah, they, they can amplify your cultivation or your shipment transportation, or you can export your produce and um, next slide. And you want to be the first that deliver your crops to the New York City, which you'll gain the most profit. And you'll, you can, yeah, you can trade it at Hunts Point, gain the money back. And it's an interesting mechanism, which is whether, whether it come into play in the whole process in the cultivation and the transportation. So we have this rule set up, which is every three months we'll have a event card draw. And after 12 rounds, which um, like kind of represent 12 months, whoever makes the most profit wins, that also reflect the capitalism in a very uh, simplified way. So we can see there, and actually we can kind of see on this slide, the, um, the symbols in the top right that represent the different products. How, how did you guys um, decide what, uh, what produce um, or what products to include in the game? So actually, we have a couple of slides of that. Um, but basically, like we went through some extensive research also kind of looking at what were the biggest uh, kind of uh, selling, uh, what are the, the produce that most got sold in, in terms of volume. 
Um, and that kind of, we use that list to kind of shorten down because obviously we can have as many products if we want, but like we have to also keep in balance like how much content are we really working with, right? And so in this sense, yeah, it was, it was a combination of those factors. And so it's also kind of this thing of familiarity to a degree um, because uh, like the, uh, the, the, the crops in this version at least were apples, avocados, I think it was also uh, bananas, tomatoes, uh, lettuce, broccoli, broccoli um, potato. Potato. Uh, peanuts, and potato. Wait, peanut. Wait yeah. peanut. No potato. Sorry. And so yeah. uh, basically, it's like these things that are very everyday for us to a degree mm -hmm. uh, in that sense as well. So, yeah, it, it's a combination between numbers, what you're used to seeing, and actually what's, what gets sold most from the places that we are kind of uh, dealing with in this case. As I, you can see here in the map, at least, it's obviously not a, a geographically accurate portrayal of it, um, but that in a way kind of goes down to these uh, stylistic slash um, kind of compositional aspects. We're, we're trying to give protagonism to at least the ones that were involved. Obviously, every country in this, uh, in this map, so to speak, does have a type of export um, that comes to the States and to New York and everywhere else in the world. But Again, we had to kind of tone it down so it's not overtly complicated. Um, we have some references of games that you could spend hours playing this. And it's just a real turnoff. It's not engaging. And it, you know, it, it's like the, the real um, high amount of information can also be not a, such a great thing when considering the playing experience. Um, so yeah, it's a mix of factors. <laughs> Um, kind of actually going to the games now that uh, we started talking about this, uh, these were some of the board games that we used as reference. So it was Freedom, The Underground Railroad, uh, Viticulture, and Concordia. Basically all of these games were in a way research, manage research, uh, resource management, sorry. Um, the interesting factors were like the processes of what you had to do. So Viticulture was for growing grapes and Freedom was the, to free the slaves from the south to the north and Concordia was kind of developing uh, different kinds of uh, crops or raw resources. So it's all a little bit related, uh, but on a much more complicated level than what we were kind of uh, addressing with the game. Um, so yeah, uh, in terms of uh, behind the scenes, uh, we, we're going to focus a little bit on the this part of the cards, which is the one that has the most uh, amount of information, basically, which is kind of getting to your initial question, um, Andrew. And so each card basically has, it's based on a series of data that we collected of the, of, of the specific crops. So among them, for example, it's uh, the duration of the cultivation process, like how much time do you have to invest? Uh, what is the major exporting country? This is not to say it's an exclusive list. Obviously there's more countries that can export it. Um, what are the harvest seasons? Because seasonality is obviously a super important thing when it comes to growing uh, crops. So we try to condense it into spring, summer, and fall, like the different quarters and every crop has a different quality to them. So you can, there are some that you can grow in one quarter and some you can go in every quarter. Um, the storage life, this is kind of like to try and balance it out so that people wouldn't uh, just stay Store waiting the and crops, then make yeah. a lot of money. And also addressing the real aspect of like, we are dealing with perishable things, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of factors, uh, the ripening process, uh, depends on how long and how perishable these things are, so they would go bad quicker. Uh, kind of fun fact, so to speak, just to spur a little bit of actual information uh, on the on the content. And yeah, basically we were using a lot of online data that we found uh, mm -hmm. in terms of top producers uh, and importers and exporters and that kind of thing to shortlist the amount of stuff that we were going to cho choose. So we looked into different uh, databases to actually kind of have an, an, uh, an approach more or less to how much time we're gonna use. But obviously we had to balance this out with the time currency in the game as well. Um, so there was a little bit of uh, having to compromise from both sides to make it at least sort of similar. Um, this is a, like another very visual approach to how we see the exporting and importing situations. Uh, so yeah, we just used 
so many different databases to kind of pinpoint a little bit more geographically in terms of uh, numbers and whatnot will be necessary to actually decide on what numbers and values the cards would have. And, and for neither of you, that this was not an area of, of expertise, right? This was a, a big learning curve. Right? Yeah, yeah. Totally. <laughs> and, and not only that, it's also the, the thing of uh, uh, board games themselves. Like you may think of board games as something that's like, oh yeah, it's just a board game. But we realize in this process, that's not the case. I mean, there's so many things to balance out. I don't know if Lillian, you want to get into that a little bit, but. <laughs> yeah, we can get into that later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yes, uh, basically, uh, again, like with the market price, this was actually one of the more tricky things that we had to balance out. It's like, how do you keep uh, the currency flowing? What would it mean to overstock and overproduce and underproduce? So this is an overtly simplified way of how do you approach these things, right? Um, but yeah, we were trying to balance out so many mechanisms that we just had to compromise it to a degree. And these were just kind of uh, references that we were taking to actually uh, determine like how visually they would look if they were ripened in the cards and so on and so forth. Um, and yeah, I don't know if Lily, you want to cover this part. Yeah, <laughs> so I, uh, well, we're learning how to design a board game and I was uh, following to a podcast and they talk about how their game always have a Google sheet. And we and I realized, okay, cool, that we're not alone because we have, obviously you have, a, uh, yeah, two, two, actually two major Google sheet that contain all the information we collect. This is more at the research stage. Uh, we want to understand, for instance, how, where is the port that, um, that's, uh, transport the banana, same banana from Guatemala, where are, where are those ports? So that we have the more accurate location of those routes, starting point, ending point. So we kind of want, um, to a certain degree, we want to have the game based on the, the real world data. This is a analysis of the seasonality for different crops in different area. So to answer the question I brought up earlier, which is how possible it is to have uh, a year round bl blueberry and supermarket. And it turns out that because blueberry we, and in winter we have blueberry from Chile, and then in spring and summer we have blueberry from Oregon and from uh, New Jersey and so Washington. So that's how the, the whole year round supply built up. So yeah, we also analyze the seasonality. And this part is more about the st uh, statistic of the games, all the numbers, how can we make the game playful enough? Uh, and one of the main uh, factor was that those uh, nitty gritty numbers that makes the game balance. So we have, um, yeah, we dig in and run through some program and finalize those numbers on the cards. And also not only the cards, but also the, the, um, the amount of time that travel from one place to other is also, uh, I won't say well calculated, but it's, well, it's calculated at some point. This is uh, the sheet about the technology because uh, in the major, uh, in the more advanced agriculture industry, they utilize a lot of technology, saying the uh, the storage part, or how to in like uh, increase the shelf life. And there are a lot of technology that they they practice. So we kind of we found it interesting, and we want to bring those in our in our game as well. So these are the the information the reference. And there's only so much, right, that you can figure out from putting things in Excel spreadsheets, right, in terms of the playability and the competitiveness of the game. I know right. you'll talk about this, but you did a lot of testing with mm -hmm. people who know a lot about board games, right? Right. So we do bring very early stage uh, paper prototype to various playtest group. One of them is uh, NYC Playtest, which is a group of I would say game experts or uh, hobbyists. They are very um, are heavily involved in board game design and we 
yeah, we basically bring our game to them and got a tons of feedback and iterate upon it. We also yeah. bring game to uh, the high school students and we're trying to understand how they, what is the dynamic between uh, the peers play in this game. And yeah, we also got a lot of very info, uh, insightful feedback from them. Yeah, and I think also kind of throughout these groups, it's precisely that we noticed that we were kind of going back to your question about what we were working with that we didn't work with before. Uh, it was just like, uh, this is where we saw like, yeah, we have this person that has been working years on making a prototype for a game. Uh, and like all of the logistics and everything that you have to do to actually make a, uh, a game go to market. Like it's very extensive processes um, and very complicated things in terms of research, investments, design tweaks, and so on and so forth. So it's, uh, yeah, we were getting into really deep waters <laughs> without even knowing it as much. Um, but it was, a, it was a great learning curve, I would say. So yeah. Um, yeah, kind of, uh, yeah, we have more basically spreadsheets everywhere. This is uh, kind of working with the data and the weather and what would it imply and uh, what were the effects that it would have. And again, it, it, obviously we were trying to be as representational of as many factors as we could but also keeping them in balance and not be overly complex and just like blur you out from just too much information. Um, but even then it was a tricky balance. And I would say that, yeah, it's a lot of stuff that we ideally would need a lot more work to keep on going. Um, so yeah, these were also some examples of events that could happen, not only natural, but also like uh, geopolitical. So for example, bad relations or good relations with different countries and export and import regulations and that kind of stuff. So these are factors that could kind of like occur at any given point. So we were just thinking like, what would these imply for the gameplay? Right? Trying to keep those uh, realistic uh, dynamics. And in terms of shipping routes, we also just had so much data that was so fuzzy and complicated because intermodal transportation, it's way more complicated than it seems. You, we just usually see the truck with the big trailer on the back, but it's it, it comes from so many other places um, throughout this incredibly complex system. Uh, and that's, again, we tried to take a little bit of that and condense it to a way that could be kind of uh, relatable or actionable. Um, yeah, if you could just go back to the previous slide, uh, yeah. the one before. This yeah. One. So yeah. So this is this is actually a website that we've shown on many of our programs, and we use it all the time. Which is yeah. Marine, marine traffic. So we just put the link into the uh, uh, into the chat. Um, but yeah, you can see all of these ships tracked through their uh, automated information system. Yeah. Pretty, pretty pretty cool. Yeah. The thing is that like uh, at least these were kind of assumptions that we had in our head. It's like, oh yeah, it's just like a boat that comes in and like, drops the stuff. But then all of a sudden it's like, no, I mean, there, there's like pre-programmed routes. There's yeah. a lot of logistics behind like how you move the containers from one place to the other and how it gets shipped out from there into the little trucks that get into the distribution centers and from the distribution centers to the places that it ends up. So it was just like so much more complex that we could have fathomed. <laughs> yeah, and we should add that that although we're talking about Hunts Point, um, really nothing comes into there by ship. It all comes exactly, exactly. else and then gets moved there. Exactly, yes. So yeah, that's like uh, one of the things that, that was like, we're just, again, trying to balance everything out. So it's like, yes, realistic enough, it's modeling the process or modeling the information, but at the same time, it's playable and kind of understandable. So it's a, a lot of juggling of these factors. Um, so yeah, and this is also like kind of like the intermodal network, uh, both in highways and, uh, and railways, which in itself, again, it's like a whole different uh, thing to a lot of uh, networks and just different ways of passing one thing to the other, um, which comes, is, it's unavoidably part of the whole logistics and how do you distribute things across the, across the country. And again, we we're just trying to condense this to, to a playable degree, at least. <laughs> um, yeah, so we also have the factor of fabrication because we also had to make this. Uh, and then that's kind of like our main technology, so to speak, we're paper prototyping, which is super useful in terms of figuring out what we were gonna do, what were the steps of the game and rules and so on and so forth. CNC milling, laser cutting, engraving, and 3D printing to actually make 
thinking. And this was all, again, thanks to, and giving a shout out to uh, Brooklyn Research and Tomorrow Lab for actually having uh, given us a space and also Future Works for connecting us to a lot of other places to learn and develop uh, the, the prototypes further. Sorry. So yeah, these are just kind of some snaps of the early and later uh, concepts that we had made. Originally, we were planning to do like a global thing, but then obviously it got way too complicated too quick. So we tried to condense it onto our continent. <laughs> um, and yeah, as you can see, like uh, we had different types of uh, approaches to the game and, and the board and uh, the, the aesthetics specifically uh, to try and make it playable and understandable and readable. And then in terms of like the, per the, the physical prototyping, we did a lot of different methods uh, from milling to cutting and laser to actually uh, produce the, a more tangible and three-dimensional uh, model of it to be to not just have a, a board, uh, like a flat board, also give it some texture and make use of the resources that we had a little bit more. These were just some of the process pictures of the milling, which was also a learning curve in and of itself. Like we had not necessarily, uh, we not necessarily worked with these technologies hands-on. So it was also like another thing that we were kind of like uh, learning in the process. Um, yeah, Lillian, this is your territory. <laughs> yeah, okay, so. Uh... One of our biggest questions, and uh, also playing in our game was the aesthetics part. What kind of aesthetics that we want to present in this game? And basically, yeah, obviously we, we have a lot of research and we found out that, hey, aerial view of these uh, farmland is very fascinating. Each of the crops have their, have their unique patterns show from the bird view eye, which is pretty much as similar as uh, the players see the, the game board. So we want to draw those inspiration and also the patterns, visuals in our game. So this is our uh, core concept in terms of aesthetics. And uh, after, yeah, after analyzing those crops patterns, I started to model you um, using the clay. That's the fastest way that I can kind of create those patterns in a tangible way. And after that, we are thinking multiple ways to uh, replicate those patterns in our board. And one of the methods is using laser cutting. This is a testing that we have uh, while we are testing the laser machine. Those nitty gritty uh, parameters when we, how to set up the uh, laser machine, the laser, yeah, the laser to fulfill our our need. This is a video that uh, while we are cutting our board. Oh, it can't play. You can't play. Mm. Oh no. Okay. No, sorry. That's no, all right. This is just uh, some laser machine uh, cutting through the board. Yeah. We can and, come back to it if we have time. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, lastly, and like these were kind of like the smaller components of it, but like uh, we also had our own respective processes of like analyzing the form and the size and just like the readability of these um, intermodal transportations and how do we kind of move the things around the board, uh, the board per se. Um, and uh, as well as uh, with the textures, we were doing this back and forth between like real life, like sketching and, and modeling in clay and then passing that down to 3D printing to see like in what ways like the sizes, tolerances and like the interplay of all of these things would kind of come together. Um, so in, uh, at the end, like for example, initially we wanted to have like a representation of each kind of uh, intermodal from like a boat to, I mean, a, a shipping ship uh, a truck and a, and, a, and a transportation train uh, or freight train, but then all of a sudden it was like people in the game were not really paying attention to that. So it was like, okay, yeah, no, we really don't need to do that. And let's just like try to condense them and make this kind of more abstract shape that would try and, and you know, uh, join all of these three together. Um, that's, as, that's what we see on the far right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can see that like the very first ones are more on the left and then like the last ones on the right, they also have these uh, little chip cards, which is like the what we were using to represent the um, 
uh, the crops. To continue. Right? Okay. So yeah, there was a balancing between yeah the form, but also like the tolerances, so that we can put the pieces in the in the vehicles and move them around, and they're readable, and they can like be more than one at a time. The proportions of that to the the paths that they had on the board. So this is like again like a lot of juggling of uh, these factors. And was, this was part of the fellowship, right? That, that you had to make a, a physical product? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So like uh, originally there was the idea was to have a, a hardware. Yeah, um, hardware. However, yeah, like our process and everything else just kind of went on and evolved into this kind of, yes, it's still a physical tangible product, but like the whole electronics aspect of it was kind of uh, phased out uh, in the process. But I think like more than that, actually, the, the whole aspect of like how we're using advanced manufacturing and digital manufacturing as part of the process and the learning curve and everything else uh, kind of also got to part of the purpose of the, of the program. And yes, that would summarize, I guess, uh, our three months of process uh, of, the, of making this, I would say, first iteration of it, uh, the, the kind of yeah, we have yeah. so many reflections and tweaks that we can do around this. Um, however, yeah, it's like a very expansive uh, process. And yeah. Uh, and how long, sorry, how long was the process from beginning to end? Three months. Yeah, so, so we had three months to come up with the idea and then make it, basically. And yes. then, yeah. We okay. spent a lot of time brainstorming at the first few months, but I, yeah, one month. And then we land on this idea and then we basically just run full speed and manufacture it. Yeah. That does not seem like a lot of time. <laughs> not no. at all, I would say. <laughs> well, we think it is, but it just flew by. And, and again, in contrast with like really refined, uh, thorough games, it's like years in the making that all of a sudden it's like, we're trying to do what people do in years in three months. It's like, eh. <laughs> so, um, yeah. and well, so why don't we take a look at the game? I mean, one thing that maybe people can see in this image um, is you can see the seams in the board. Um, so it's in pieces. It's it's huge. How how big is it? The when the board is all put together, almost around two feet by two two square feet, a little bit more, I would say. So I don't know. Like I don't know if it works, but it's something like this <laughs> I know it's like i'm virtual so it doesn't matter but right you get like and, a, and it's all made out of wood so we'll, we'll, we'll we won't see the whole board put together but lillian is going to show us some of the some of the pieces uh and some of the panels of the of the board yeah. right okay so let's take a look i can at stop the... sharing the screen so yeah. you can uh... oh, okay cool and um let's just walk you through very basic uh, like the beginning of the game. So um, starting from the game, you will, you will have a starter card, crop card, which looks like this. And for instance, this is a banana. You have to grow a banana from Costa Rica. And uh, you have, you, th this is the seasonality that you can grow, which is whole year round. And yeah, you, well, you player, you can start from this. Um, let's see. So you can see Costa Rica is here, and there's different routes that will connect you to the New York City. So, for instance, say you have harvested a banana and you can ship from Costa Rica here, spend money and time resource that uh, required to this marketplace, which we present. Uh, Hunts Point Market. Uh, if saying that you are the first one who delivered the banana to the city, you'll get 10 points, uh, like 10 money back, and you can inv reinvest the, the money into your, your growing crop process. So this is like a basic process of how you play the game. Um, yep. Also, here are some technology cards that you can invest. These are the money you have to get in order to uh, acquire the technology. What else? And 
and every so each player has a time tracker we call this time tracker and you will have to count down so every round you'll have 14 days to grow your crops or do any things that require time and this is just a uh, like indicator that help you track how much time you have left in each round do we, do we have any question around the game or no yeah, sorry, Lillian. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about some of the materials that the, the board is made of? Oh, yes. So, yeah, obviously the cards are made of paper, but the the transportation we just take, uh, yeah, that Angel just talked about, it's, yeah. it is made of by 3 printer, P -L -A, P -L -A? P -P -L -A. okay, yeah. And these chips are, laser cut it it was a uh, um, mat board so we yeah, exactly like, board. we were kind of thinking about like what would be the process to actually give color to the players and whatnot and we figured that actually trying to hand paint this or print this uh, at least with our time constraints would be a little bit tricky and so we tried to recur to actually using a material that already had color that we can kind of uh, work with so that's how we turned turned up to mat board um, which is like a condensed type of cardboard, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so that actually gave us a possibility of not only having color, but also laser cutting it and laser engraving it, which ended up being one of the things that we mostly use um, for the game pieces and like smaller um, uh, game elements. So. Yeah, and it also sort of define the aesthetics of the game, as you can see, very woody looking, and but it still have a layer of color on, on top of it. Yeah. Um, I saw some questions on the bottom, but I don't know if, uh, Andrew, if you're moderating that or should I? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, well, I just wanted to um, make sure people uh, are, are seeing the board up close. I know for some people, maybe they were seeing all three of us, but hopefully now you're, you're seeing the board um, up close on the screen. Um, I had a question, which is, uh, have you, uh, did you get the chance as part of this process to go to the Hunts Point market? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, we tried to actually coordinate with, uh, with the people in the program, but it became like a little bit tricky uh, coordinating it. However, I uh, did try to make like a undercover kind of <laughs> uh, trip to the area just to see how it was. So I took a bus basically to Brooklyn, I mean, to, to the Bronx and just like, looked around and see if, uh, if there was actually any way of accessing it and just like at least have an idea of like where the railroads ended or where this, uh, you know, where did the things get switched off and who goes where and what, but unfortunately we couldn't actually get into the market. Um, that was, that was a little bit of a, uh, yeah, difficulty we had. Um, well, uh, as a little, uh, as a little, uh, teaser for what's coming up, Sometime in the fall, we're going to be doing one of these virtual programs live from the market. Mm. Oh, very so, cool. Nice. Uh, yeah. Um, so someone asked here um, if you would, if, if you guys would be interested in, in bringing the game to the market and, and playing it there. <laughs> uh, as, as far as I know, I know the market's pretty busy. There are a lot of people <laughs> walk in and out. I don't know if you have that space. You, you'd <laughs> also have to, mind. to play the You'd also have to play it about 4 a.m., I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> yeah. Um, Howard has a question now, now that we see the board. Um, but uh, the oh. uh, uh, oh. Howard is asking what, how um, randomness and dice kind of play into the gameplay. Mm, yeah. Great question. Sounds like you're a Elise, someone who are familiar with board game so before like several iteration before this uh, version of it randomism is a big component in our game basically it define how how much movement that each player can play basically yeah it's like a role and play game and we brought this version to the playtest group and we got feedback around that mechanism and be, the, the main 
argument was the rolling mechanism wasn't, wasn't that meaningful enough, especially when this is a educational game. What does this roll die mean if you roll one or six? Does that mean that you're lucky or you're, you're what, what does that, what does mm. the meaning carry? And yeah. we realized that point. So we pretty much lowered down the randomness to, yeah, to, to the, to uh, yeah, limit to the weather event. Yeah. Still play in some, throughout the game, but very limited. I, I think also like uh, this is one of the things that we learned in the process as uh, Lillian was saying, it's uh, pretty much like the roll and roll and uh, roll and move kind of dynamic is kind of uh, it's a stereotypical approach to board gaming. But according to what we were seeing from them, it's actually one of the least engaging uh, ways of actually doing this because it would not only it's the randomness of something that you strategize, but it also can be like either really, really good or really, really bad for the players. And so that was kind of going against this whole log logic that we wanted to actually get a little bit into how you're planning and how you're managing your resources. And so that's why we decided to not necessarily have that as a main mechanism of moving. However, we did want to use uh, them into the weather uh, because then that would be like a little bit of a randomness into it. Yeah, another part is you can predict what other player plays that, is, that randomness is also very common in other resource managing game. Uh, some, yeah, like saying Angel might deliver the banana one step bef like before me so that he can get the champion uh, the most amount of money than I do. And that ra randomness is uh, also play uh, yeah, throughout this game as well. Hmm. You're on mute, Andrew. Thanks. We have just a couple minutes left. Um, I don't know if there are any other parts uh, of the game that you want to show us. Otherwise, we'd love to see your face, Lillian. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a couple questions here. One is, um, what, what did you find was sort of the average length of, of gameplay and how many players could play this at once? There are four players. Yeah, yeah. At most, this is a four player game. Uh, we play with two people, which is very competitive because, uh, yeah, every move that you'll impact me directly. Um, how long? It's around one to two hours, I would say, before yeah. we have, like, endless, yeah, each player can do everything they want until the resource, their, their resource is running out, but we sort of limit it to you can only do three actions per turn so that the game will never end. Yeah. yeah, and also we were kind of trying to constrain it within the four quarters. So kind of like also to be able to play a little bit across the seasons. And what would that imply for what you have? So you're always starting the quarter at the beginning and you have a couple of turns. I would say it was, uh, I don't know, like eight turns or something like that, but each turn could be a little bit lengthy because you had to kind of know what you're gonna do and where you're gonna move it. So that's why it can vary from like one hour to two hours, uh, kind of. So your model was not Monopoly? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we try very no. hard to move away from that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. People, people who enjoy board games know that it's one of the worst, worst design games ever. Um, but interestingly, like your game, it was actually created as, as a game to, to educate people. Um, that actually to educate people about how terrible rent is. Uh, mm. And then it was kind of co-opted as this celebration of capitalism. Mm -hmm. So we'll share some links about the history of Monopoly. But um, we, we have some questions here about kind of what, what's, what is the next step for this game? You know, you created this in, in a three month process. Um, you tested out some people. The idea was this would be an educational tool. Um, do, you, do you see any, any future for this game or what would you, if you did want to develop it more, what, what would you want to change about it? I think, uh, I don't know, Lillian, you can go ahead first. Sadly. I have strong opinions about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of debate around this. Um, for, yeah, I think there is a lot of potential of this game. It's just a matter of how much time and effort that we want to invest in this game. Because uh, we make the, yeah, we kind of condense the, 
development process within three months and it required a lot of time to do more iteration to become a commercialized game. So I know we are still a distant ed edit, uh, but I do believe that it has the potential of become an interesting resource managing game. Uh, if we think from like, is yeah, if we think of this like, educational aspect of this, our main learning goal is for a user to experience that system and do we do we uh, fulfill or like aiming that goal? I think I think we do. So if if that is a mm, like a criteria to define how well the game is doing, I think uh, I will give it positive. But yeah, Angel have a lot of <laughs> counter perspective, so go for you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <Take> over. <laughs> uh, I think one of the main things is that uh, kind of as we were reflecting a little bit earlier, it's like this kind of representation model of what's happening now. Uh, or what kind of is happening now. But the problem is that now is full with so many problems. Um, when we're talking about like, yeah, uh, land use, uh, carbon emissions, uh, work, uh, work practices, uh, social geopolitical relationships, and so many other issues, right? Uh, you can tie them to sustainability or well-being or circularity or however you want to uh, frame that. And I think that uh, to actually have more relevance nowadays and probably in the upcoming time, however much that time is, we do need to make a lot of modifications because again, in this case, it's just like, yeah, who wins the most, but is that really what's most important now? Um, are we talking about food? We, we talked at some point about like, yeah, well, if you like food waste, that's penalty or food waste as a measuring system to actually see if you win or lose. Right, and kind of be a little bit more uh, punctual with, with what we're saying with the game. And at least I, I would say uh, as a designer or as an educator or whatever it is that you want to frame it as, the game would need to adjust itself to those realities of, of our complicated situation now to, to actually even kind of say like, okay, yeah, I would market this because it has a deeper message. Yes, it, it still has to do with the complex dynamics of intermodal shipping and how you move one thing from one place to the other and whatnot, but still, uh, even within that, I think there's a lot of more relevant things that we could say with it. Um, but obviously that takes a lot of time to strategize. So I wouldn't do it, I wouldn't market it just yet. Um, and if I were to develop it, I would try to be more um, incisive on what it's saying as a game. Yeah. And, and like you both said, this is a process that takes years to develop years. A, a good board game. And so yeah. I, I think you've made such a tremendous first step. And like you said at the beginning of the presentation, New York City's food system or any grocery store you go to anywhere in America is a black box. And I think there really is a need for more resources to help make that the story um, and the, the process of, of yeah. bringing food to our plates um, you know more more understandable and relatable mm. um, yeah, yeah. Lillian was there something you want to add um, I guess uh, one uh, yeah another aspect is like tuning those numbers which is yeah so what makes a good board game is often the well-balanced numbers those um yeah so they did a bunch of programming to optimize the best uh like number scale for each element in the game and we are far from that every testing we have with other people uh, we realize, oh, there is a flaw, there is imbalance, and we change it, and that occurred to that that occur another imbalance. So that's an ever-ending uh, iteration. Yeah. The one um, inspiration we got from the board game uh, freedom we talked about it earlier, which is a more collaborative approach, which I think it's pretty. Yeah, it would makes a lot of sense if. 
we um, started this game at the beginning as a collaborative approach or the game because this is an educational game and if they can kind of collaborate with their peer, talk about the strategy in order to fulfill that New York City um, need or yeah, demand that I feel like that will make the, that will elevate the, the game. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. Well, we're, we're just about out of time. Um, I, if anyone has any last questions, please, please drop them into the chat. But I want to thank you guys so much for, for coming on. And I'm so glad that we just met uh, serendipitously at the Brooklyn Army Terminal last year. Right. Uh, it's been so wonderful to, to learn more about this really fantastic project. Um, and there's always work to be done to everything. But I think you guys should be really proud of, of what you made, um, and especially in such a short period of time. It's, it's really amazing. Thank, Thank you. you, Andrew. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, do you guys just want to tell us a little bit about kind of what, what you're up to now? Uh, sure. Angel, if you want to start. Yeah, I have to, I have to head out soon. So uh, yeah. yeah, really briefly, like I'm currently you now working on uh, research projects towards uh, how can uh, the institute, institution that I'm in, which works with design, architecture, urbanism, and landscape, um, how can we collaborate more across the institutions to kind of work more towards circularity and sustainability as a unifying concept? So from the design of uh, places, products, services, and so on and so forth, like how can we actually um, tweak the education offer a little bit more towards uh, reaching the, that possibility of not only cross collaborating, but ensuring or working towards circularity and also kind of working with uh, Hopefully for my uh, master's thesis project, I'm going to also be addressing these things of uh, cross, cross uh, disciplinary collaboration for different purposes. So maybe with architects and design and so on and so forth. But yeah. So you're not just thinking about these concepts in the context of board games. No, no. no. <laughs> 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 yeah. And, and, and tell us just briefly kind of what, what you're up to now. Right. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a product designer in a, a digital agency. I currently building a app, which is around lawn care that help, uh, yeah, house owner or lawn care owner, uh, lawn owner uh, manage their lawn, which is still a bit like related to like nature, nature part of, um, yeah, like nature, which is something that I'm always interested in. Um, I'm still, yeah, because of this project, I become, became a vegetarian and I'm still am very happily and hmm, because of the COVID situation, I'm going to travel back home for, uh, like several months and then come back to New York. So perhaps we'll see each other soon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, well, thank you guys so much. And, and thank you to everybody who's joining us. Uh, you can join us for our next program, uh, which is going to be on Monday. We're going to go to another part of the Bronx, actually. We're going to go to City Islands uh, and learn about the boat building history from the City Island and Nautical Museum. Um, and please check out our website, turnstyletours.com. Consider becoming a member and, and support uh, great programs uh, like this one. So thank you guys so much and, and uh, enjoy the thank rest you. of your Saturday. Have a good weekend. Yeah. Thank Bye, you. guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a good weekend.